Welcome to the eMedica MRCGP AKT High Yield Revision Webinar 3 for the October 2021 exam. So the format today, we're going to go through 15 exam style questions covering key topics, followed by rapid reviews and examples. So we're going to split this session into three parts. Part one, we're going to look at five interactive questions. The format will be, I'll show you the question. You'll have 55 seconds to think about it. Then I'll launch a poll. Please use the poll to answer the question. Okay. Don't write it down into the chat or into the Q&A. Use the poll to answer the question. And after each one, we will go through the answers, a review of the relevant topic and uh, sort of, you know, the relevant guidelines and so on. And perhaps go through why you might have got the wrong answer, some of the technique. Part two, we're going to do a timed mini mock exam. 10 questions. You'll do all 10 in one go. The questions will move forward automatically every 55 seconds. And I won't launch any polls until the whole thing's finished. Then we'll go through each of the questions in turn with answers and reviews. Then part three, the last session, we're going to look at revision planning, how to make the most of the last four weeks. What should you be focusing on? What should you do in the last couple of weeks, just as you come up to the exam? And then there'll also be a time for Q&A. And we should be finished by 9.50. Okay, so we're going to go straight into question number one of 15. Please write down one to 15 on a piece of paper at home and keep track so that you can see how you get on. Okay, and I'll tell you how to interpret that score later. So when the question comes up, you won't see or hear me. You'll have 55 seconds. Please do not type any answers into the chat or into the Q&A. Wait till I launch the poll. Okay, here we go. Okay, so the two most popular answers are A and C, okay? Every single answer has been picked though, but A and C are the two that are most popular, okay? Now you'll notice that in this audiogram, and any picture question, picture questions pe people often struggle with in the exam, but any picture question, it's really important to look at both the picture and the scenario. So if we look at the scenario first, what we've got is someone fairly young, 38 year old, they're an engineer. Now, sometimes, you know, things like what someone's job is might give you some clues as to what, might be going on. For example, if the patient was in their late 60s or 70s, can you see what's the most common cause of a sensory neural hearing loss? And it's often bilateral. I'm not saying that that's what this is, but like if the patient was late 60s, early 70s, what would be something that you'd be really thinking of straight away? You'd be thinking about presbyacusis because that's really common as we get older, right? Because can you see, it doesn't say what type of engineer, but for example, if someone is a a mechanical engineer or an engineer where they're actually testing things, they might be working around a noisy environment, even though they're young, can see there could be a risk of hearing loss, right? Okay, so it could be relevant, it might not be. And then we'll look at the actual picture. Now you notice here, the ears aren't, haven't been labeled. That's part of the test, right? Okay, that's actually what this is testing, because if it was labeled, then there wouldn't be any test, it'd be really obvious, okay? So what we've got is one ear, the hearing seems to be in the normal range, but one ear can see it's, it's reduced. Okay, so it's working out what this is. And so this is where the test comes in. The right ear is always red. So the right ear is basically normal. The left ear, there's reduction. Once we get about here onwards, there's reduction. So the correct answer is A. Okay, the hearing in the right ear is mostly in the normal range. All of this in the normal range, just right at the end, that's just a little bit reduced, but it's not significant loss. Okay, now the other answer that was really popular was C that this is consistent with a conductive hearing loss in the left ear. This isn't. So if, for example, they were to show a conductive hearing loss in the left ear, what you'd expect to see is another red line, okay? So you'd expect to see the bone conduction and the air conduction in the left ear with a gap. But we're not shown that. We're only shown the air conduction 
in the left and the right ear. We're not showing bone conduction at all. That's common when it's a sensory neural loss. Okay, so that's why C is incorrect. Now, someone could easily think that if they thought these were both the left ear and they were thinking that this is the gap. This isn't, this is the left ear. Sorry, this is the right ear. This is the left ear, okay? The right ear is always red, okay? And then, and the next most popular answer after C was E, that both ears showed mild hearing loss in the low frequency range. If you look at the low frequency range here, okay? This one's completely normal. The right ear is completely normal. This is showing some loss, okay? In the low frequency, it gets worse once we get into the high frequency, but this is completely normal all the way up to here. So that's why E is incorrect, okay? So let's look at audiograms and how to understand them. So the first thing is, just remember B for brackets, B for bones. Bone conduction where shown, and typically they'll only show bone conduction where it's a conductive loss. But in a bone conduction, the conduction shown by brackets, either square brackets or triangular brackets, they're both used in different audiograms, depending on who's doing it, okay? But it's always brackets for bone conduction, okay? And then air conduction, usually one ear will be shown with a cross, one ear will be shown with a circle. Just remember that air passes through a circle. Okay, so here's an example of what you'd expect to see in a conductive loss. Okay, so look, bone conduction brackets normal in both the right ear, which is red, and the left ear, which is blue. And look, the air conduction reduced in both ears, but more in one ear. So what does this suggest? Like, what kind of thing might you see this in? You might see this in a bilateral otitis media with diffusion, where one side the diffusion is much bigger than the other. For example, there's got to be something slowing down that air conduction and reducing that hearing, whether that's fluid, whether that's a tumor. So for example, if it was one-sided and that patient also had discharge, they might have a cholesteatoma, okay? Um, and then this is typical of presbyacusis, which is the most common cause of sensory neural hearing loss. It's the hearing loss of old age. So what's typically seen is that the low frequency is normal and then the high frequency, it starts getting lost, okay? Look, significant reduction in the high frequency. So just remember the right ear is always red, Ruffer red, ruffer right, and the left ear is therefore going to be blue. Okay, so we'll go back to the next question. Question number two, men's health, another topic that we know people struggle with. Here we go. So every single answer has been picked. The most popular answer is D, but A and B aren't far behind. Okay, so, but every single answer has been picked, all right? Now, this is an example of two things. So one is, it's what I call a two-step question, i.e. the mark is for management, right? But the question, the first step to work out the management is to work out what's the likely diagnosis. And actually, you could have a different, question where you had a similar scenario just like this, but instead of asking what's the most suitable management, you might say, what's the most likely diagnosis? Or what's the single most likely diagnosis? So let's do that. Type into the chat, what do you think is the most likely diagnosis from this presentation? So most people are saying epididymitis or epididymal orchitis or um, orchitis or epididymitis, or something along that line. Uh, a few people thought prostatitis and a couple of people thought torsion. Now you see, working out the first part is really important because it's gonna help you get the second part right. If you get the first part wrong, it might mean that's why you get the second part wrong because your management is gonna be wrong. So that's the first bit I wanted to say. And I said, there's two things. The second thing is it's a really long question, okay? So a lot of questions in the AKT, they might have three or four lines. You get very few that are much shorter than three lines. Okay, you might get the odd one, but then you get some that are like this. Look how long this is. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and a bit lines. 
For long questions, an important bit of technique I recommend is look at the end first. What do I mean by that? Look at the actual question. So it's saying most suitable management. Glance at the answer options, because you can see it, this is all about management for something. Now, when you're reading, you're going to pay really close attention to things that might change management. Okay, because for example, even for the same condition, sometimes the age of the patient might change what management is suitable. Sometimes one key feature, one key symptom, or an absence of a key symptom might change, or a key clinical sign or examination finding or blood result might change how you manage it, even you know, for the same condition, because there could be levels of severity that change management. So, okay, when we read back at key things, four-day history of pain and swelling in someone who's in their 50s. It's not changed much in two days, and it's taken some ibuprofen. No trauma. He had recently a UTI and not been sexually active in the last month. Now the examination this is really important. There's mild tenderness and swelling of the right testes. Pren sign is positive. Anyone know what Pren sign is? Type into the chat. What is Pren sign and what, what does a positive or negative sign look like? So Pren sign is that you elevate the scrotum. And if the pain is relieved when you elevate the scrotum, that's Pren positive. So what this is saying is that this patient's got swelling and mild tenderness on the right side. You elevate the whole scrotum and that pain settles. Okay. Why is that useful? Because torsion can present like this, but in torsion, Pren sign would usually be negative. First of all, the pain would be really severe. It wouldn't be mild. It would be very severe tenderness. They would barely let you touch it. But when you lift it, it makes no difference to the pain. So this is one of the things that are going to help us take our differential of could it be torsion, could it be um, epididymorchitis, and say, okay, much more likely to be, but also in this age group, no history of trauma, also much more likely to be epididymorchitis. Okay, everyone see that? Okay, now it becomes more difficult. Epididymorchitis, there are two variants. So you could get epididymorchitis that's related to a recent STI, or you could get it that's related to a recent UTI. The like if it was related to an STI recently, you know, things like chlamydia and gonorrhea, you can then get this. If it that's less likely, then things like E. coli can also lead to this. If, for example, they've recently had a UTI. This patient's not been sexually active, but had a UTI. So do you think they've got the STI form or the UTI related form? What's more likely? UTI related, right? I.e. things like E. coli. Okay, that's important because it changes the management. So the correct answer is D. Levofloxacin, 400 milligrams, once daily for 10 days, okay? Why? Because they're more likely to have epididymorchitis secondary to this recent UTI. It's unlikely to be sexually, uh, you know, in relation to an STI. Whereas if you thought it was, for example, kef keftriaxone and doxycycline, like this would be, if you treated someone, if you thought, you know, could be chlamydia and um, gonorrhea, that's what you treat it with, okay? So first part is working out what it is. Second part is working out how to manage it. So how does it present? Typically, it's a gradual onset. It usually is painful and tender, but not at the level of tenderness that you might see in, in, in torsion. There's usually a palpable swelling. There'll be overlying erythema. And then a really useful clue is that Pren sign is usually positive. So when you elevate the scrotum, so therefore elevate the testes, the pain goes away, okay, which you wouldn't get in torsion. And in terms of management, if the patient was septic, systemically really unwell, very high fever, sweating, maybe, you know, really unwell, you might admit them because they might need IV antibiotics and so on. Generally, if they're willing to go to see gum clinic and you thought that they had the STI variant, you know, you'd want to refer so that they can get a full workup and be tested for these things. But sometimes patients don't want to go, in which case we can treat them in GP. And you treat based on the likely cause. So if you think like they have, they've got discharge, they've got symptoms, you know, you think that they might have an STI, recently sexually active, then gonorrhea is something to think about, chlamydia, you know, so keftriaxone with doxycycline, plus or minus azithromycin. And then if you think an enteric organism, like they recently had a UTI, is more likely, and they're low risk for STI, then you can either give ofloxacin 200 milligrams twice daily for two weeks, or levofloxacin 500 milligrams once daily for 10 days. So again, if I take it back to the question, quite a few people um, picked this option here, C, okay? Ofloxacin 200 milligrams, single dose. The reason this is wrong, this is the right drug, but it's not single dose, it's 14 days of treatment given twice daily. So it's missing the fact, there's nothing you're gonna treat with ofloxacin as a single dose. You need to have this for a longer time, okay? And then 
The other ones that were common, those of you that said admit to hospital, again, if you thought it was torsion, I can see why you'd think that, but that doesn't really fit with this scenario. And then again, those, if it was more likely to be STI, then you might be picking this, but that's unlikely with this patient. So again, a very high challenge question. Okay, so let's move on to question number three, antibiotics. Here we go. There are two answers that are really, really close, actually. So A and B are the two really popular answers, a similar proportion of you picked that. And then very few people picked C or D. No one picked D, okay? So again, there's two steps to this, okay? So we've got the description. The question's asking about the most suitable management according to the fever pain criteria. You see, so the management is the what gets you the mark. So therefore, the first step is to work out what do you think the fever pain score is for this patient? Type that into the chat. What do you think this patient's fever pain score is based on the description given? Okay, so we've got one, two, three are the answers I'm seeing so far. Okay, so one, two, three, and probably two is the most popular one. Okay, you'll see why this is important because it's what's going to help you determine if the answer is A or B. Okay, right, so the correct answer is B, offer a delayed script for PEN-V. That's because this patient's got a fever pain score of three. Let's look at where they get the three points for. So the first thing is that they've presented within three days. So a two day history, you see. So they've presented within three days of symptoms. So they get a point for that. Mother, mother reports she had a fever of 38.1 earlier in the day. Even though to, on examination now, the afebrile, the fact that they've had a fever within the last 24 hours and that you just have to take the patient's word for it, okay? So you just accept that mum is recorded this, okay? Has taken it, that gets a point. So we're on two. And then the fact that the tonsils are inflamed, that's the eye, you get another point for that, okay? Someone said absence of cough and coryza. You don't get a point for that, she's got a runny nose. So she's got coryzal symptoms. So you don't get a point for that, okay? She'd get a point if she didn't have a runny nose, okay? Um, and so can you see total score is three and the guideline says for that score, you should offer a delayed script for PEN-V. Now, let me ask another question. How many of you actually thought that might be what you do based on fever pain, but then because the mother demands antibiotics, you sort of had a reflex reaction. I don't like it when patients demand things and so thought I'm not gonna give it. And actually you were thinking initially B, but you changed it from B to A <laughs> because you didn't like the fact that the mother demanded antibiotics. Okay, someone's been honest and said that, okay? And someone else has said that. See, this is really, really important. We have to treat patients based on the evidence and on clinical need, not just based on you know, their behavior or if we like it or not. And remember, look, if the mother is behaving in a certain way, that is absolutely not a reason to punish the child. The child is the one that's unwell, do you see? So you've got to first know the guideline and then apply it based on the evidence and not be swayed by emotion, okay? So let's go through fever pain. So you get one point for each of the following. So fever within the last 24 hours, and that includes patient reported, or in this case, if it's a child, you know, parent reported temperature, okay? P is for pus, okay? So pus on the tonsils, back of the throat, they didn't have that. A is for attending rapidly within three days from the start of symptoms, they attended within two days. So they get a point for that. I is inflamed tonsils. N is no cough or coryza. So not having a cough, not having cold-like symptoms. They had a runny nose, so they've got coryza, so they don't get a point for that, okay? Now, if they score zero or one, the likelihood of it being bacterial is very low. You should not give antibiotics. If they score two or three, there's actually a fair probability that it is, anti uh, it is gonna be sensitive to antibiotics, that it is likely to be bacterial, but 
it may also well get better on its own. So the guideline recommends consider a delayed script if they scored two or three, and this patient scored three. Whereas if they scored four or five, consider starting antibiotics there and then, okay? And then what's the first line? First line is PEN-V for 10 days. If they're allergic, this patient wasn't, but if they're allergic, then you could either use clarithromycin or erythromycin for five days, okay? So that's why the correct answer is to consider a delayed script, but for which drug? For PEN-V for 10 days, okay? Someone's asked a good question. Um, is Centaur still in use? So the NICE guidelines actually mention both fever pain and Centaur. Fever pain is slightly more accurate. Um, and so, you know, in real life practice, there's no point in doing both scores. You just want to learn one. So I use fever pain because, you know, it's got a stronger evidence base. But because both are in use, it would be unfair if they just said, what's the most suitable management in a question where the answer will be different based on Centaur or fever pain? if they didn't specify, but this question specifically spe specified fever pain, do you see? Okay. Question number four, access to medical records. This is the admin domain. Here we go. Every answer has been picked. The three that are most popular are the last three. So C, D, and E. These are the three popular ones, okay? So key thing here is that this patient isn't trying to access their own records. He's trying to access his father's records, and his father has unfortunately passed away. He's the next of kin and the executive of the will. You know, the reason is he's thinking that the practice has done something wrong, and he wants to take legal action, okay? So the correct answer here is E. If you want to access someone else's records who's passed away and you have a legitimate reason to do so, like you're the next of kin or the executor of the will, and maybe you're thinking about legal action, then the right act is the Access to Health Records Act 1990. So E is the right answer. And well done, that was the most popular answer. So most of you got this right. But as I mentioned, the other two that were really popular are C and D, okay? PALS at the local hospital is irrelevant for GP records because it wants to access the GP information, okay? Um, so when would C and D apply? Let's go on to that. So three really important bits of legislation in relation to accessing health records. If someone wants to access their own information, so if you wanted to get access about information about you held within the medical record, you apply under the Data Protection Act 2018. If a company wanted to access information on their employees in relation to an occupational health matter, then the act for that is the Access to Medical Reports Act 1988. And then if someone wants to access records of someone who's passed away and they've got a legitimate reason to, to do so, they're the next of kin or the executor of the will, and maybe, you know, they think something's gone wrong, usually it's to take legal action, then it's the Access to Health Records Act 1990, okay? So it's important that, that if someone applied to access someone else's records under the Data Protection Act, you couldn't give it out under that act, okay? It doesn't apply. Similarly, if someone wanted to get their own information and they apply under this act, that's the wrong act, okay? Right, data interpretation, here we go.
again, every single answer has been picked, but actually there are three that are popular. The most popular answer is D, Doncaster, but close behind is Bradford and Barnsley. Okay, these are the other two that are popular, but every single one was picked. So it's an example of the new style data interpretation questions. The great thing, what I really like about this type of question is that if you spend a bit of time getting familiar with the format, it doesn't require knowing any definitions, doesn't require any calculation. You don't have to get your calculator out. You don't need to remember any formula. It literally is just interpreting the data, okay? So part of that is to read the question really carefully. So this chart shows mortality for parts of Yorkshire, which area had the worst mortality rate for women under 75. If you look here, you've got mortality rate, mortality rate, mortality rate, but we've got here mortality rate from all cardiovascular diseases. So do we want to look at these bottom three? or the top three, first of all, when we're narrowing it down? The top three, yeah? Because this just says mortality rate. That means mortality for any cause. Whereas these bottom three are only looking at cardiovascular mortality. So we can ignore these three. And then within these three, you can see it specifically says women under 75. So persons means male and female. That's male, that's female. So the first thing is to make sure you're looking at the right line. We're looking at this line. And then it says the worst mortality rate. So the worst mortality rate is the highest number, right? Not the lowest. So what's the highest number on this line? The highest number on this line is 324. So all you've got to do is read where that is. That's Doncaster. So the correct answer is therefore D, Doncaster. OK, so, you know, most of you got that right, actually. Um, it was the more popular answer by a big margin. OK, um, but quite a few people did get it wrong because they either picked B or A. So why might someone have picked B, Bradford? So Bradford did have the worst rate if you looked in the wrong row. If you looked in men, you can see they had a much worse rate than Doncaster. Similarly, if you looked at all people, so men and women, you can see it had a much worse rate. So that's why people might have picked um, Bradford if they were looking at this. Similarly, if you look at cardiovascular mortality for women, Bradford had the worst rate, okay, out of all of them. So some people might have read women under 75, but not read that this was just worse mortality. They looked at cardiovascular specifically. OK, that's one reason they might have got it wrong. Other reasons they might have got it wrong, just looking at the wrong role, looking at men or looking at all persons. OK, um, and then the other answer that was popular was Barnsley. So why might someone have picked Barnsley? OK, so. The only reason I can think someone might have picked Barnsley is that they looked at this and looked at this and just didn't look further along and see that Doncaster was worse. OK, uh, why might someone have picked? Not many did, but a few people picked East Riding of Yorkshire. So East Riding of Yorkshire actually had the lowest rate, which means they had the best mortality, right? Okay, you can see mortality is deaths. You want a lower number would be better. The worst mortality is the higher number. So someone might have just misread that, missed that one word worst, and just thought, okay, this is the lowest number and picked it. Okay, that's why they might have picked East Riding of Yorkshire, all right? So other types of data interpretation that, have started to come in is sort of prescribing data, uh, regional disease incidence and prevalence, public health data to do with things like incidence of cancer, two week weight referrals, um, you know, infant mortality, cardiovascular mortality, general mortality, but also interpreting research. Okay, so for example, looking at things like antibiotic prescribing, um, age bands in particular practices, antibiotic prescribing in different practices, and things like that, you know, mortality data, things like this. So if you play around with the public health website, fingertips.phe.org.uk. Um, you can get access to lots of this stuff. It's all free. You can access data about your region, and it's worth looking into that. Okay. So any questions, ask them in the Q&A. But just to highlight, you know, we've touched a little bit on stats, a little bit on admin, a little bit of um, clinical. Um, coming up soon, starting on the 12th and running until the 14th of October, are our AKT masterclass webinars for each domain. So each time it's three and a half hours, and it's just like how we've been doing it now, where we do one question at a time to time conditions, then immediately afterwards we go through the explanation, the technique, why you might have got it wrong, and the relevant guideline. You'll get sent the teaching slides beforehand so that you can sort of start preparing. And we cover all the key stats topics you need on the Tuesday, all the key admin topics in one evening on the Wednesday, high yield clinical topics. These are all the clinical topics examiners mentioned in recent examiners reports. These are often be tested. That's on the Thursday. So all of you that are on our past guarantee program, you're all already going to be signed up for those. You don't need to do anything. We'll send you out the, uh, you know, the, the booklet the evening before. 
For those that aren't and are joining just today, if you found this way of learning helpful and you want to cover a lot of topics in one go, they're £99 for any one or £249 for all three. If you have around to the end, I tell you that if you also want to join our full day AKT200, which is happening this weekend, that there's a, a, an even bigger discount than this. So those are 12th, 13th, 14th of October. You also get access to the recording for a month afterwards. And if you're available on those days, you can just subscribe directly to the recorded version. Okay. But they're three and a half hours each. So all the key stats topics on the Tuesday, we've had lots of people get 90, 95, 100. So we'll go through 45 questions, but more than 60 topics, because sometimes after doing one question, I'll talk about two or three related topics and in the guidance, all the key admin topics um, on the Wednesday, again, 45 questions, but more than 60, all the key admin topics from the curriculum, basically. And the higher clinical has the most questions. So we'll do 55 plus questions, but more than 70 topics, all the key topics that examiners mentioned from the clinical domain in recent uh, years, okay? So we're gonna move on now to do 10 question teaching mini mock. So what will happen is I'm not gonna launch any polls for this. I'm going to just play all 10 questions, one after the other. They will automatically move forward every 55 seconds. Just write down the question number and your answer at home. Don't put it in the chat with the Q&A. And when we're done with all of them, we'll go through the answers and explanations, okay? So here we go. First question is beginning in five seconds.
let's uh, go through the answers. Um, mark your own. You get one mark for each one that you get correct. I'm not going to launch a poll for every single question. Um, what I will do is I will launch the poll for some of them, but I think are particularly high challenge or that I'm really interested to see what you thought. Okay, but I won't launch it for one of them. I will for this one because this uh, subject we know people struggle with. Right. Okay. So again, every single answer has been picked. The ones that are most popular are C and E. So AT and 120. These are the two that are most popular. Okay. But all of them have been picked. So key thing here is that you've got a patient who's on 120 milligrams BD. So twice daily of morphine orally. And that is controlling their pain well. The reason that they need to move something non oral is can you see that the esophageal cancer has progressed such that they can't swallow anymore safely. So they can't take oral meds anymore. So very common when you've got someone near the end of life that we will put them on a syringe driver. Now, the reason I wanted to launch a poll for this one, every single AKT by regulation must include drug dosage calculation questions. Usually there'll be more than one. So common to have at least one testing like a cancer pain type calculation, and usually at least one, a pediatric drug dosage calculation. Okay, so it's worth practicing both of those. So the correct answer here is C, 80 milligrams diamorphine over 24 hours via, what is CSCI? Continuous subcutaneous infusion, syringe driver. Okay, so as I said, the majority of you did get this right, but a lot of you picked 120, that's too high. Okay, and then after that, quite a few people picked 40 or 60. All right, the, the least popular answer was D. So let's look at the conversion and we can look at why people might have got those wrong. So 120 milligrams of oral morphine twice daily is 240 milligrams that they need to control their pain. You see, so you want to put them on at least that much. You don't want to put them on less than that. You don't want them to be in more pain just because they can't take orals anymore. Everyone agree with that, yeah? So to convert from oral morphine to diamorphine in a syringe driver is really simple. You just divide by three. So their total morphine is 240. 240 divided by three is 80. So you'd give them 80 milligrams of diamorphine over 24 hours. As I mentioned, the second most popular answer was E120. Where would it be 120? If it was not diamorphine, but morphine given via injection. Because morphine by injection is twice as powerful as morphine orally. Diamorphine, though, is three times as powerful. That's why we need to divide by three, okay? So syringe drivers, very useful for palliative care because as well as giving the diamorphine to manage the pain, into the same syringe driver, you can add in things like midazolam, for example, if they've got some agitation. You can add in things to help dry up secretions. You can add in things for nausea, okay? So it's really, really useful. So what you do is you calculate the 24-hour oral morphine requirement including if they're not, like this patient's pain was well controlled. You might have a patient whose pain isn't very well controlled and they're also needing some breakthrough doses. You need to calculate how many breakthrough doses they use as well, i.e. the total oral morphine requirement in 24 hours to control their pain. And then if you're converting to morphine, because you could put morphine in a syringe driver, then you just divide by two. But if you're converting to diamorphine in a syringe driver, you just divide by three. So you see, this patient's total morphine was 240. So if you were changing that to morphine in a syringe driver, not diamorphine, you'd divide by two, that'd be 120. But for diamorphine, you divide by three, so it's 80. If someone was on you know, 120 milligrams of oral morphine in total, then for diamorphine, divide by three, that'd be 40. So as you see, if we go back here, common mistakes. Some people missed that this was twice daily. So they just thought, oh, 120, divide by three, that's how you'd get 40. You missed that they were having this twice daily. The other common mistake, people saw 120 twice daily, 240, and thought, oh, divide by two, and that's why they picked 120. But the, the factor for morphine by injection is two, for diamorphine, it's three, okay? Okay, I won't launch the poll for this one, but the key thing here is to read the question. So what we've got is carriers for hemochromatosis, both the mother and the father, or the potential mother and the father, they're thinking about family planning. They wonder what's the risk of their children having the disease, i.e. having full-blown disease. So what type of inheritance is hemochromatosis? Type that into the chat. It's autosomal recessive. Great. So if both parents are carriers, what's the risk that their children will have the disease? They have to get two faulty genes to have the disease. It's 25%. So D, uh, C, 25% is the correct answer. Can you see? And the key thing is 
that it's of having the disease. Sometimes people get this wrong because they just think, oh yeah, they're both carriers. So, you know, there's a 50-50 chance that the child will become a carrier. That's not what the question was asking. It's a good example where someone could have good knowledge, just miss this bit, having the disease, not becoming a carrier and lose a mark because of exam technique. Whereas the third one, so question number eight, here it was of becoming carriers, becoming carriers. So that's 50%, isn't it? Okay, so D, 50% is the chance of becoming a carrier. So let's go through the genetics of autosomal recessive disease. So for hemochromatosis, this would be the same for any other autosomal recessive disease. So think about things like sickle cell, for example, okay, cystic fibrosis, okay. Um, so you've got one gene from your mom and one gene from your dad, right? So a carrier will have a hemochromatosis gene and one normal gene, okay? So both parents have got one faulty gene, the hemochromatosis gene, one faulty gene. Do you see? If there's a one in four chance that you're unlucky, that you get the faulty gene from mom and the faulty gene from dad, and you have full-blown disease, there's only 25% chance. There's a 50-50 chance that you get one faulty gene from one parent and a healthy from the other. Could be either from mom or dad, doesn't matter, okay? 50-50 chance. And then there's a one in four chance, 25% chance that you're fortunate and you get both the normal genes from mom and dad. Now, not only will you not be a carrot, you've got no chance of passing it on to your children, okay, to the next generation, okay? So that's autosomal recessive. So 50% chance of becoming a carrier if both parents are carriers, 25% that you have full-blown disease, 25% that you're healthy and not a carrier, okay? And I've listed here the modes of inheritance of the relatively more important or common disorders for the UK population, okay? Genetics, by the way, is one of the curriculum areas that we know people struggle with from the clinical domain, okay? Okay, question number nine. So oligomenorrhea, I will launch a poll for this one because it's got two important things in it. So the first is that it's a, a multiple best answer. Can you see ask for two? So you have to get them both right to get the one mark. If you get one right and one wrong, you get no marks. There are no half marks in AKT. You either get a mark or you get no marks, okay? The other thing is that this is a question that's negatively framed. Can you see I've put this in bold. In the last couple of sittings of the exam where they've got negatively framed questions, they've started either putting in bold or underlining. They haven't always done that. So you'll see another question later where I haven't done that because it's not been the case in all exams, okay? But, you know, which two of the following would not be recommended as part of the diagnostic workup for this patient? So the key thing is you're not picking which ones you should do, okay? And a good way to look at negatively framed questions like this is to think you're going to look for the odd one or in this case, odd ones out, i.e. most of these you would do for this patient or would be sensible, but two of them would not be sensible. You're looking for the ones that don't quite fit. And what we've got is someone, erratic periods for about a year. Sometimes, you know, it comes six weeks, eight weeks, sometimes no periods for a long time. Also got various changes in like mood, weight, things like that, okay? So correct answer here is A and H. A pelvic examination is not indicated because this patient hasn't got bleeding, recent smear was normal. There's no other sort of red flag signs that make you think I need to do a pelvic examination, okay? And then anti-mullerian hormone, that's not recommended as part of a normal diagnostic workup for someone with sort of uh, oligomenorrhea. Whereas actually all of these things would be sensible because they could contribute to us to narrow down our differential, okay? So what this lady might have given her age and the symptoms is premature ovarian insufficiency, okay, POI. So when to suspect it, under 40, not on the combined pill, and they've got menopausal type symptoms. So this lady's got infrequent and erratic periods. She's got changes in mood. Do you see, that's all um, fits with menopausal type symptoms, okay? And sometimes they'll have a period of no periods, but then it spontaneously comes back, okay? So investigations that might show some findings, FSH might be raised, okay, 30 plus, two different samples, at least four weeks apart. Other things that you might do, LH, okay? Estradiol, prolactin, TSH, testosterone, these all are in the guideline as possible things to do in your workup. Whereas what you shouldn't routinely do is pelvic examination or AMH to, uh, you know, sort of help you make that diagnosis. So again, looking at it and working out, what am I looking for here? What's in the first step? Premature ovarian insufficiency, okay? Right, GMC guidance. So this is from the admin domain again. Here we go launch the poll for this one because it's a, a multiple best answer again. So which two, in terms of the GMC guidance, this is very important, GMC guidance on gifts, 
which two of these statements are correct. So, you know, um, you've got this thank you card from someone whose family member you've looked after, okay, during their last illness. Okay, so popular answers here are B, E, and F. These were the three most popular. So I suspect what's going to happen is a lot of you will get one of the two right, but get one wrong. And so you, unfortunately, you wouldn't get them all. So the correct answers are B and F. That unsolicited gifts from patients or relatives may be accepted in some situations. Okay. So the GMC says when we can and can't accept gifts, that you can't ask people or pressure people to give you a gift. You shouldn't take a gift if it might lead to that patient getting an advantage compared to others, or if it might be seen as a conflict of interest. None of that occurs here. This patient's passed. It was their last illness. OK, it's not like you're going to give them, you know, um, different treatment to others. You're not going to have any treatment for this patient anymore. OK, and you didn't ask for this. They've just given it. So in this situation, you'd be OK to accept the gift. OK, and then F, the GMC don't specify any maximum value. So why might some of you have picked E? Because that was a really popular answer. A value of 100, because that's the case for not GMC guidance, but GMS guidance. GMS is one of the four types of NHS. GP contract. There's GMS, PMS, APMS, PCLMS, okay? If you hold a GMS contract, then if you accept a gift of £100 or more, you need to record that in a register of gifts at the practice. That's nothing to do with the GMC. The GMC don't specify any maximum value. So B and F are correct. The reason E is incorrect is that it's nothing to do with GMC. That's to do with the GMS contract. So like, I have to follow what the GMC says because I'm a GMC registered you know, clinician, I'm on the GP register, but I don't have to follow what the GMS contract says because my practice is not a GMS practice, okay? So GMC guidance, you're not allowed to encourage patients to give you gifts or pressure them to make donations, even if it's to charity. You're not allowed to alter the management you give to a patient or the service you offer to a patient. But if it's given in an unsolicited way, you didn't ask for it, and it's not going to lead to a conflict of interest, it's okay to accept it, and they don't specify any maximum value. Whereas if you hold a GMS contract, nothing to do with the GMC, which is what the question was about, then if you accept a high value gift and that's considered 100 pounds or more, that should be recorded in the register of gifts at the practice, okay? Okay, so number 11, young patient, 48, persistent synovitis of unknown cause, affecting small joints of the hands and feet. So you've ordered some bloods, probably going to look for things like rheumatoid factor and ESR and things like that. And you've given us some painkillers. You probably get some NSAIDs. OK, so what's the most appropriate next step? Correct answer is A. Refer to a rheumatologist within three working days. Don't wait for those test results to come back. Why is that? Because it's affecting small joints of the hands and feet. That's one of the red flags that warrants an ultra fast referral within three working days. Because all patients with suspected rheumatoid should be referred within three weeks, but those with red flags, it's even quicker than that, okay? So A is the right answer. So anyone with suspected rheumatoid arthritis, refer within three weeks, but who to refer within three days? What are the red flags? The small joints of the hands or the feet have been affected. More than one joint is already affected at presentation, or they've already had symptoms for at least three months, i.e. they may well have significant progression of disease. So we want to get them seen as soon as possible so they can get onto disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs, which is why you don't wait for blood test results before you actually do the referral, because that could mean that they have more progression of disease. Okay. Right, I will launch a poll for this one. So every answer has been picked. The popular ones are actually, very few people picked A, but B, C, D, and E are all popular, okay? So the correct answer here is E, 27 units. Well done, most of you did get that right, but quite a few of you picked B, C, or D. So why might that be? Okay, so let's look at the quick way. The quick way is if you learn how many units are common types of drink. And so if you just know that a large 250 ml glass of wine, at an average strength, this is a fairly average strength, has three units in it, then it's really easy that you just multiply that by the number of glasses. But that's not how many glasses isn't easy. You've got to read carefully. Look, seven nights a week, i.e. Monday to Sunday, every evening, no matter what day of the week it is, this lady will have a large glass of wine. But look, on Saturday and on Sunday, because she's not at work, she's a teacher, okay? She also drinks another large glass at lunchtime. So how many glasses does she drink in the week? Nine. Seven from the evenings, 
eight because of Saturday lunchtime, nine because of Sunday lunchtime. You see, so that bit is tricky. So nine times three units, 27 units. You could do that in your head. I'm going to show you the formula if you want to calculate it absolutely accurately. You're going to get the same answer, but the, the formula to calculate it really accurately is that units is the volume in milliliters multiplied by the percentage alcohol by volume as a percent divided by a thousand. So look, 250 mils times 12%, divide that by a thousand, you get three. Let me show you. Okay. 250 mils multiplied by 12% alcohol by volume. That's 3,000. Divide that by 1,000, you get three. So there's three units in each glass. Then multiply by nine, you get 27. So why might people get this one wrong? So some people might get it wrong because they just count the seven. Okay, so seven times three, they get the 21. They missed that on Saturday and Sunday. She's having another one each day. Okay, and so that's why they might get it wrong. So this is how many units are in sort of common drinks. So wine at fairly standard strength, which is about 12%. Some wines will be a bit weaker, some will be a bit stronger, but at fairly standard strength, a small glass, which is 125 mils, is one and a half units. A large glass, which is 250 mils, is three. Standard strength beers between three and a half, four percent. A pint is two units. Premium beers and lagers, five to six percent. A pint is about three units. Cider, similar. A pint is about three units. And then spirits, 25 mils of any spirit at 40 percent strength. That's the standard strength of most spirits is one unit. OK, so if you learn that, then you can do it in your head. It's you know, you can estimate you'll be close enough to get the answer right for AKT. But if you want to do it absolutely accurately, you can get your calculator out. You've got the formula there. OK. All right, it's diabetes management. So two answers that are really popular. And that's B. So put them on NPH insulin and continue the metformin. And D, put them on Detamir and continue the metformin. OK. Key things here is that this patient's already on multiple treatments, metformin, citagliptin, and pyoglitazone. And it's got very poor control. Look, 70 millimoles per mole is I, poor enough that we want to think about the next step, but not so poor. Not like, you know, 95 millimoles per, per, per mole that we might need to not go with a sort of gentle regime. OK, so we want to start a suitable initial regime. We want to start something gentle. OK, so correct answer is B. And that was the most popular answer. So well done. OK, so let's look at why. So NPH insulin is a long acting basal insulin. So what you do is this gives you a low level of insulin. You often will get it once daily where you take it in the evening or you can get a twice daily regime, but basically it's giving you a baseline level of insulin. And if someone is got, you know, multiple medications, you keep them on the metformin and review whether or not you want to keep some of the others. Like this guy, his controls poor, but it's not so poor, so it's not 75 plus, it's 70, then we probably don't need to go straight to two different types of insulin. Because if it was like, say, 80 or 90, as I mentioned, you might go not at a gentle regime like this. You might start them on NPH as a basal and then also short acting insulin before every meal. Whereas because they're still going to continue their metformin, that gives you another level of cover to think about the meals. OK. When might you think about Detamir or Glargin instead of insulin, um, NPH insulin? If the patient sort of really needs a lot of care. They can't manage in injections themselves. They need help with the injections. Or if once you start them on a long acting basal regime, they still get recurrent symptomatic hypos and think, you know what, they're, they're gonna need additional help. And one of the things that they are gonna need to do if they're on an insulin regime is to regularly monitor their blood sugars because some patients may then need a top up before meals, okay? Other things that you want to learn about insulin is how to calculate how much to start them on. We'll, cover that at one of the other courses, okay? Okay, and then this one, in the exam, you'd be actually typing in your answer, okay? So because the question asked to type it to the, and some of you might never seen a, a free text question, there are no options to guess from. So you do your calculation, you type the answer, okay? The only answer that will give you the marks is 41,560. If you don't have the comma, that's fine. If you wanted to type out 41,560, they'd give you the mark, okay? But the key thing is that it's got to be exactly this. Why? Because it's said to the nearest whole number, okay? So let's do the calculation. The question, so this is about COVID-19 cases in the last year. This is actual data for death in 2020, the last year, because we haven't got full years worth of data this year. Have we? So there were 
2,770,000 cases. And unfortunately, 76,000, you all know that this figure has gone up significantly since then, but this is talking about 2020, okay? There were 76,305 deaths. Now the question's asking about the incidence of COVID-19 per million people. So we don't need to look at the deaths because it's not asking about COVID-related mortality. Although that information is there, you see, this is irrelevant to us. So sometimes people are get distracted by this just because it's there and they use this number, they're gonna get totally the wrong calculation. Okay, so first thing is to know how to calculate incidence. Incidence is simply number of new cases divided by the total population. So the incidence is this number, 2,770,000 out of the total population, which they're giving you, 66,650,000. This was the total population in the UK at the end of 2020, okay? That gives you this number, okay? But look what it says. The incidence of COVID-19 per million people. So some of you, might have just wrote 0.041. You wouldn't get a mark for that. Some of you, what you will have done is you will have times this by 100 and put 0.04. You wouldn't get a mark for that. They didn't ask you the percentage. Percent means per 100, okay? But if it's per million, what you need to do is take this number and multiply it by a million. So when you multiply it by a million, this is what you get. 41,560.39. But it said round to the nearest whole number. So what you do is you look at the number after the dot. If this number is five or more, you add one here. So it would become 41561. If it's four or less, so it's three, then you don't add anything and this is the number. So 41560 is the answer. So if you put that without a comma, you'd get the mark. If you put it with a comma, you'd get the mark. Anything else, you wouldn't get the mark. Now you might be thinking, why per million? That's because if you look at all of the international data on incidence of COVID, it's always reported as incidence per million. Okay, so it's standard worldwide. That's what every country uses to report their incidence of COVID. It's new cases per million. Okay. So incidence, rate of new cases of a disease. So, you know, sometimes for some illnesses, we do report it as a percentage. Otherwise, it can often be reported as a proportion of the population, i.e. per thousand, per hundred thousand, per million. Okay. So, Often it's over a time period, 1% per year, means one in every 100 per year, okay? Or two per 100,000 per year, all right? So all you do is number of new cases divided by the population. If you wanna get it as a percentage, after that you multiply by 100. Percent just means per 100. So it's always per something, isn't it? If you want it per 100,000, multiply by 100,000. Here we wanted it per million, so you multiply by a million in that last step, okay? And last one, so, just launch the poll for this one. While you're just selecting that, a few people have asked, is there a calculator in the exam? So there's an on-screen calculator. It's in the top left-hand corner. When you click it, it comes up. It's a very basic calculator. Looks like this. No scientific functions, just like basic plus minus divide. Um, you know, That's all you need to do is add, divide, multiply, subtract. You don't need to do anything more complex than that uh, for <laughs> uh, AKT, okay? Okay, so most popular answer here by a long margin was D. So what you've got someone, they're on diazepam and they're reducing that. And now they've got this sprain. So the key question here is that it's negatively framed. The least suitable. So the least suitable is absolutely codeine. Why? If you've got someone who's on diazepam and you give them codeine, you could cause respiratory depression. That could be fatal. So you need to avoid opioids. Okay. So this is the least suitable. Why might some people have got this wrong? Because they just might have missed the fact that it's the least suitable. Okay, I hadn't bolded it in this one, just to highlight that they haven't always done that in the exam, all right? Whereas, you know, giving them top dose paracetamol would be fine, giving them ibuprofen or diclofenac or a combination of an NSAID and paracetamol, all of these would be fine, okay? So safe prescribing, there was a recent MHRA alert about this, and these are things that are often tested, okay? That says avoid prescribing opioids with benzodiazepines because it can cause respiratory depression or coma or in, a small number of cases it has caused death. If you absolutely, like let's say you had a patient who just couldn't have NSAID, for some reason couldn't have paracetamol, you absolutely need to give them an opioid, give them the lowest dose for the shortest duration and give them strict advice that, you know, someone needs to be with them and any sort of uh, difficulty or changes in breathing, they need to seek medical assistance, okay? So add up your score out of 15. So we did the five that we did one at a time. And then we did the 10 that we did as a mock, okay? And by the way, you know how we did that as a mock, the 10 questions in one go? 
This weekend is our AKT 200 mock grammar course. So it will be in that format. We will do four 50 question teaching mocks. So right in the morning, straight away, you'll do 50 questions, one after the other, no gap, no break. Every 55 seconds, the questions move forward. I won't launch any polls. Then immediately after, we'll go through the answers, discuss 50 topics, guidelines, you know, go through the technique, and you'll get the teaching slides. Then we'll have a break. Then we'll do another 50. Then we'll have lunch time. Then we'll do the same in the afternoon, another two. So by the end of the day, you will have done 200 questions in sort of mock conditions. We will have discussed 200 topics with the current guidelines, but also discuss why you might have got questions wrong. And then afterwards, you get access to another full 200 question online mock with completely different questions. OK, so that, you know, you can use that nearer to the exam. So anyone that got 11 or more, that would be a pass on any sitting of the AKT. Anyone that got 10, that's borderline. In some, it'd be just below. In some, it'd be just above the pass. If you got nine or less, don't worry. You're not sitting the exam tomorrow. If you're sitting the exam tomorrow, then I'd worry. But you're not. The earliest you can sit in the exam is four weeks. Four weeks is huge in terms of how much impact you can make. The point that we're deliberately doing hard questions that are on high yield topics that we know people struggle with is one, to help you understand technique, to cover hard topics, cover topics where you might not realize the guidelines have changed or there was a recent MHRA alert, but also so that we can help you identify areas in the curriculum that maybe you need to do a bit more work on that maybe you've covered it early and forgotten or didn't cover in enough detail to make maximum use of these next four weeks. So don't worry, but use this as a learning to think, okay, I'm gonna now make the most of this last four weeks and I'm gonna really, really smash it, okay? So revision planning for the last four weeks. At this stage, you should have covered most of your revision. You should have touched on all of the sort of important areas. You may have done, you know, um, some timed mocks by this stage. What you want to do is you want to systematically cover any gaps in the curriculum so that there should be nothing in the curriculum that you haven't at least looked at once. And then what you should make the most use of in the last two weeks is you will have covered stats and admin and all the key clinical topics at that stage. But the maximum value you're going to get in the last couple of weeks is to revise all of stats, all of admin, so you can get a really good mark there. And then focus on the high yield. You haven't got time to revise all the clinical topics again in two weeks. But in that last couple of, if you focus on the high yield clinical topics, the ones the examiners have identified, you're probably gonna get a lot of benefit in terms of pushing up your marks and maximum value for the time invested, okay? Our AKT 30 day challenge started two, three days ago. Today's day three. So every AKT exam, the last 30 days, I post a question into the GP training support group and the AKT group. So someone in the team will post the links to that every single day running up to the last day and then the very last day i post some um, tips for the actual exam technique for the day okay so please follow that it's just it takes you five six minutes maximum i do a question like we did at the beginning in exam conditions then immediately afterwards i go through what's the answer i analyze the question the technique and we recap the guidance okay and like for example where things change so you will see it a bit later on there'll be some that i, will, I haven't even filmed yet i'll be filming later because the guidelines have changed so i need to put some new ones in okay um, keep working on your exam technique. So, you know, keep practicing online revision questions. Try to do some timed mock exams, okay? If you want a really realistic one, the ones that come with our AKT 200, and there's a different one that comes with our full day AKT course, which was uh, a couple of weeks back. Those are really, really realistic. We've also got another one as part of our online revision service. We've got three different full AKT mocks. Make sure you've covered every topic in our high yield topic checklist. Someone will post a link to it for you shortly, okay? Again, those of you, in our structured program, don't worry, all of the links will come to you automatically, right? You don't need to worry about writing anything down now. But essentially, these are all the topics that the examiners have mentioned in examiners' reports in the past, or have mentioned multiple times. This isn't all of it, there's more, okay? So just print it off, stick it on your wall, tick it off, make sure there's nothing here you haven't crossed off. It includes topics mentioned in the last exam. These things are often retested because if you miss by one or two marks and there was something on this list and you hadn't read it, you'll be kicking yourself because the examiners are telling you, we're going to put this in the exam, right? They're, they're giving you that clue. And then at this stage, you probably haven't got time to be reading full nice guidelines for the first time for every topic. So if you want to cover lots of topics quickly and you haven't already got our clinical case cards, uh, these are the 2021 seventh edition, okay? Um, so these were published end of July, 2021. They're bang up to date. So, you know, they're numbered, um, they cover 
topics in a concise way. So some are about, for example, um, how how to spot and make a diagnosis, what to look for, but also management. And like, for example, this is a picture of someone with impetigo. For example, these are the latest notifiable diseases in all four nations. You can see SARS-CoV-2 was only recently added. Um, and as I said, it's bang up to date. So even, for example, the fact that has bled has now re been replaced for bleeding risk with orbit, that only happened in the 2021 AF guidelines, which was published June 2021. So when we publish this in July, it's up to date. So we've got the orbit bleeding risk score, okay? And then, as I mentioned, uh, this weekend is our AKT 200 mock crammer. So very long day, 9.15, the mock starts. We'll actually get you to log in a little bit before that. The actual first mock will kick off bang on 9.15, 50 questions in one go, like we did the 10 question one, but 50. Then we'll go through the teaching. So by the end of the day, you'll have done 200 topics, 200 questions in the right proportion of the real exam, 80% clinical, 10% stats, 10% admin. Again, high yield, high challenge questions to get you exam ready. There's very few of you that are going to do that much work on your own in such a short amount of time. You know, our team have done that much work to prepare all of this. So in a very short amount of time, you can cover a lot of topics and help you to realize what else do I need to do in these last few weeks going up. So that's this Saturday, 9.15 to 6.35 p.m. So I mentioned those of you that hang around, if you've not already on one of our structured programs, we do offer a huge discount if you book what's called our AKT booster bundle, which is basically all of those things that I mentioned. So it's over 25 hours of learning, but very, very high yield and high efficiency. So it includes the full day on this Saturday, the 200 mock crammer, it includes the three masterclass webinars, stats, three and a half hours, admin, three and a half hours, clinical, three and a half hours. It includes another full, unique 200 question online mock. And so you put all of that together between this, 500 plus topics, you get the recordings for all of this afterwards as well, and you get a PDF booklets so that you can quickly revise this, okay? Um, so if you were to buy all of this separately, it would cost over 550 pounds. If you book the bundle, it's 449, so it's over 100 pounds saving. So that's the 2nd October, full day, 12th, 13th, 14th, 7 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. each evening, plus access. And if you want to get access to that, um, someone will post a link to it in the group. Um, but essentially, I'll just show you. If you go on our website, which is emedica.co.uk, so everything we do for AKT is here, okay? But you just go here, AKT 200 question crammer, and the booster bundle is the top one. You see, you don't need any codes or anything. It automatically applies that discount, okay? So over hundred pounds saving if you book the whole lot. If you just wanted to attend this weekend, you can book that, that's 250 pounds. You can just book that. That does include that 200 question mock afterwards. Similarly, if you just want the stats webinar, let's say that you, you feel confident in everything else. Again, if I go back to the main ho homepage, you can just pick whichever one you want. So just stats is here. So any one is 99 pounds. If you book all three, again, it automatically takes a discount. So you pay 249, it will take a 48 pounds of automatic. You don't need a code or anything like that. So. Any questions, ask them in the Q&A and I'll answer that. But because of time, I'm just going to summarize for those that are leaving and haven't got questions. And I just really wanna say, look, the last four weeks is really, really crucial. I know how hard you've all been working and you will see now, this is the time to really pick up that intensity, to really make the most of every single day, okay? And if you can do that, as Muhammad Ali said, you know, don't count the days but make the days count. If every day you put in the hours, you make the efforts, you practice questions, you revide guidelines, you learn the topics, you focus on things that you're less confident in or any gaps, anything that you've missed yet. Between now and the exam, you can add a huge amount of percentage. It's, you know, four weeks is a huge amount to make significant difference to take someone who's not ready to the point they will be ready. As long as I've already worked hard, like someone starting from scratch, you can't prepare in a month, okay? It's better for you to sit in January, but you've been working hard. Most of you that are sitting in October, you've already been working for, you know, at least a couple of months, some of you even longer than that. Okay. So just make the most of every single day, keep pushing. I know you'll be fed up of studying now. At this point, often people, they lose motivation. You get fed up. You're busy at work. You know, things are going on. This is the time to knuckle down. Okay. To really put that extra effort in. And I promise you it will pay off. Okay. Prepare and you will succeed.